Okay, so yesterday I watched a TV miniseries on Netflix, which was produced by Sci-Fi, and it reminded me of a very interesting little chapter of space exploration that's quite often forgotten, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. So first, a little bit about the program. Uh, the program was called Ascension, and I thought the premise was very interesting. It's supposed to be set in the present day, but it is set aboard a generation ship which launched about 50 years ago. Uh, the idea of a generation ship is that a crew departs from Earth or wherever it's flying from, and the crew themselves never make it to the destination. The crew's children may not even make it to the destination, or even the children of the crew's children. In fact, they make it quite clear early on in the story that the ship is only halfway through a hundred-year voyage. This produces quite an interesting dynamic because it means that most of the characters on the ship have had absolutely no experience of living on Earth. They were born on the ship and they have to be resigned to dying on the ship before it reaches its destination. It does beg the question, how would humans cope being born into such a situation and having nothing but their immediate surroundings to look forward to for their entire life? So that was something that I quite enjoyed about it. Something else that I did really enjoy as well was the aesthetic of the whole thing. The ship itself was built during the 1960s and therefore all of the styling was built on a 1960s theme of science fiction, which I thought looked very good. There were, however, a few things that I didn't particularly enjoy about it. One problem I've had with a lot of science fiction, particularly science fiction miniseries in recent years in fact, ever since Battlestar Galactica was made, is that they tend to follow a model of let's make a political drama about people bitching about each other on a starship rather than actual science fiction. And that can be a bit frustrating at times. The other thing that gets a bit frustrating is that this series, without wanting to give any spoilers, doesn't actually tell a closed story arc. There isn't an open middle and end to the story. It seems that they just want to kick off a bunch of dramas without any particular endpoint in mind and hope they get funded for a sequel, which can be a bit frustrating. That said, one thing that's quite interesting to look at is the obvious question, which is, could the United States really have launched an interstellar spaceship in the 1960s? It sounds a little bit implausible, but then there's a hint fairly early on when it explains that this is an Orion-class spaceship. They are, of course, alluding to Project Orion, which is what I'm going to spend most of this video talking about. You might find it quite surprising to learn that the United States was actually looking at launching some very large spacecraft during the 1960s. This was something that was going on before the moon landings, before the Apollo program. Project Orion was something very different to the rocketry that we're all familiar with. You see, the problem with conventional rockets is that they are limited by the amount of energy that's contained in a chemical reaction. The Saturn V rocket that carried the Apollo astronauts to the moon burned a mixture of kerosene and liquid oxygen in its first stage and then used hydrogen and liquid oxygen in the upper stage. A rocket works by throwing material out of the back and the efficiency of a rocket is dependent on how much energy you can give to that material as you throw it out. Because the source of energy for a chemical rocket is basically combustion, there is a built-in upper performance limit. This makes them very inefficient. To give you an idea, the rocket that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon, the Saturn V, weighed 3,000 tonnes at launch, and that was just to take three men and a capsule the size of a small car to the moon and back. So Project Orion came out of an event that happened on the 16th of July 1945 at a site known as Trinity in New Mexico. This was the test of the world's first atomic bomb. And of course the energy released by an atomic bomb is significantly greater than the energy that's released by a chemical reaction. The bomb that was detonated at Trinity was a device called the Gadget and it was about the size of a washing machine. But the amount of energy released was the explosive energy equivalent to about 22,000 tonnes of TNT. The word bang doesn't even begin to describe it. Something unexpected that came out of it, though, was a scientist working on the project by the name of Stanislav Ulam. 
made the suggestion that this could actually be used as a means of propulsion. Suppose you had some kind of vehicle and threw one of these bombs out of the back and detonated it. You could ride the blast wave forward. At first, this might sound completely mental, but Ulam actually pointed out that the gadget had been mounted on top of a tower, and if you went back to the site of the detonation, you could actually find most of the tower. It hadn't been vaporised, most of it was still there. A bit flattened, perhaps. Anyway, after the Russians launched Sputnik, the American government was very interested in anything they could do to catch up again in the space race, so they initiated Project Orion in 1958. The project took place at a small company called General Atomics under the guidance of a man by the name of Ted Taylor, who had been responsible up until then for designing nuclear bombs for the United States. It also involved a physicist, British physicist by the name of Freeman Dyson, no relation to the vacuum cleaners. So what does a nuclear bomb propelled spaceship look like? Well, it might come as no surprise that if you set off a nuclear bomb very close to a spacecraft, you get quite a sudden jerk of acceleration. So all of the designs they looked at involved some kind of pusher plate, which was connected to the main spacecraft by a system of shock absorbers. Because the kind of forces that this spacecraft would be seeing would be so large from a nuclear explosion, there was no choice, in fact, but to build the spacecraft very large, and also out of steel, unlike rockets, which are generally built out of aluminium. With most rockets, what you are trying to achieve is the lightest structure possible, whereas here, if you make the structure too light, you in fact run the risk of squishing the crew, which is not particularly pleasant for anybody. So the structure of this vehicle will be more akin to an actual ocean-going ship, or a submarine even, than to anything that we've seen in aircraft or rocketry since. The vehicle depicted here was expected to be up to about 85 metres tall, which is a bit shorter than a Saturn V, although the mass could be up to three times that of a Saturn V, coming in at just under 10,000 tonnes. The other thing is, once you take this acceleration limit into account, there is actually a maximum delta V, a maximum change in velocity that you can feasibly get out of a single explosion. Freeman Dyson actually calculated this to be of the order of 10 metres per second, but it's simply one bomb would not be enough. You would need lots of bombs. In fact, the assumption they made was that they would be setting these things off maybe once a second or even twice a second. This is one of the reasons why a lot of the information about this project is still classified top secret. You can imagine there are a lot of people that we wouldn't want to know how to build very small, very efficient nuclear devices. The design of the actual bombs, or pulse units as they're quite euphemistically called, is quite interesting. It may surprise you to find out that when you detonate a nuclear bomb in space there isn't actually that much to see because it's exploding in a vacuum. There's just a lot of radiation produced. The idea behind the bombs on Orion is that the x-rays that are produced by the bomb are all directed onto a disc of propellant made of a hard material like tungsten. The material is ablatively vaporised and turns into an expanding cigar-shaped mass of plasma, one end of which crashes into the back of the pusher plate. Then there's the design of the propulsion system itself to consider. One thing that I found quite remarkable looking at this schematic of the back end of the spacecraft is just how far the pusher plate itself is displaced by each explosion. The shock absorbers themselves are simply enormous, and it also looks like the shock absorber system is in two stages. So there's a lower first stage, then some kind of intermediate platform, and then the much larger second stage. It reminds me actually a little bit of the suspension on railway carriages, which also uses two stages. The propulsion system also features a pulse unit ejector tube, which is another euphemism for saying a kind of cannon which delivers these bombs to the back of the ship. Apparently during Project Orion they consulted with the Coca-Cola company to see if there were any similarities between this technology to place the bombs in the cannon and the machines that were used for putting Coca-Cola into bottles. It's easy to look at this system and appreciate it firing once, but what you have to realise is that this machine would have to fire up to twice a second. So that's bang, 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 with nuclear bombs. Stand well back. And you would have to, because the craziest part of this story is that the Orion would not be constructed in space. Oh no, 
this thing would be built on Earth, and it would launch off the surface of the Earth. The Saturn V rocket has often been called the loudest noise made by man. I think this would probably be louder. And brighter. The advantage of Orion as a propulsion system, of course, is that it's much more efficient than a conventional rocket. So the spacecraft that we're considering here would actually be able to fly as far as Mars or even Saturn. It would carry a crew of 10 or 20 people. It would be able to land at its destination. It would also be able to take off again and fly back to Earth and make a propulsive landing back on Earth. And, apart from the bombs, it would be totally reusable. The thing I find remarkable about this project as an engineer is that the technology for this engine exists. We could potentially build one of these things today. In fact, it's been feasible for 50 years or more. So why haven't we? Well, that should be obvious. The key word here is the word bomb. To fly an Orion into orbit would require the detonation of close on a thousand nuclear bombs, and landing it would no doubt require a similar number. Since the 1960s, the detonation of nuclear bombs in the Earth's atmosphere have been banned by international treaties. That might be with good reason. Freeman Dyson once calculated that statistically, per launch, an Orion would cause between 0.1 and 1 fatal cancers from the fallout. That's the radiation release during launch. There's also a problem in the present day that didn't exist back in the 1960s. Nowadays we make significant use of solid-state integrated circuits in our electronics, and in particular in the satellite network. The electromagnetic pulse created by setting off nuclear bombs could potentially do serious damage to those networks. So it looks like the only place we could actually use an Orion spacecraft would be deep space well away from the Earth. And the problem with that is, well, how do you get it there in the first place? So there you have it. Project Orion. It's crazy. It would work, we could build it, but we probably won't. <laughs>